Venable uh, is travelling and is one of these very special and precious FDNC registered teachers um, who's given particular attention to centres that don't have a Geshe or a resident teacher. So we're very, very fortunate that uh, uh, Venable comes to teach us. So thank you so, so much. And uh, Venable will be teaching the week as well. So thank you. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> So uh, welcome everybody, and um, before we start, let's just uh, take a minute and connect with our motivation by reading the four immeasurable thoughts. So on page seven, uh, the short prayer. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings never be separated from the happiness that is without suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from both attachment and hatred, holding some close and others distant. And so just sitting with those four immeasurable thoughts, rolling them around in your mind, and specifically focusing in on compassion, thinking may all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. What does that actually mean? What does that actually look like internally and externally? Just be with that question for a minute. What is compassion? Okay, <clears throat> so just uh, having kind of woken up that concept in your mind, what is compassion? Um, I thought we would talk a little bit about what are the things that we do wrong in, in practicing compassion. And by doing wrong, what I mean is ineffective, doesn't work. Yeah, because it's something that probably we're all on board with is a good idea, or we wouldn't come to a Buddhist center. We all think compassion's a good idea, whether from a secular perspective, kind of a humanist perspective, or a spiritual perspective, or a religious perspective, everyday perspective. We're probably all good with the concept that compassion is nice, and um, something worth developing, something worth integrating, and yet, and yet sometimes we are not compassionate. Um, and then the other piece of that is, why aren't we compassionate to ourselves in a way that's effective? What does compassion look like when you're applying it to yourself? Because if you haven't quite sussed out what self-compassion looks like, or feels like, or is experienced as, how on earth can you be compassionate to others? And it's an interesting kind of paradox, because sometimes the kindest, most compassionate people haven't totally figured out the first step. They've jumped over the first step, which is how do I have compassion for myself? And because they've jumped over that first step, then the work they do for others is on shaky foundation. And it leads to things like burnout and bitterness. It leads to things like uh, paralysis and sort of feeling frozen and overwhelmed. Um, it can lead to all sorts of, um, you know, kind of neurotic martyr behaviors, right? So if you haven't really sussed out what does self-compassion look like, then you're never going to be as effective as you want to be when working for the welfare of others. Do you agree? Yeah, and have you, I mean, it's easy to see in your friends and loved ones, um, harder to see in yourself. Easier to blame the outside world for your compassion not working. Um, you know, and so, I, so we want to start with just kind of unpacking what does self-compassion really mean, and um, the name of this public talk is Renunciation is Self-Compassion. And it should be a little bit provocative because renunciation is also misunderstood. Um, it sounds like, I don't know, an austere ascetic lifestyle living in a cave. It sounds like uh, giving up of things that are pleasurable. That's what it sounds like when you hear that word renunciation. And a renunciate is someone like a monk or a nun or a yogi in a cave or a sadhu. And so it's uh, not strange that we have this association with this word, but what does it actually mean is a determination to be free. A determination to be free from what? 
to be free from suffering, right? So already you can see the parallel then. If compassion is the wish for all sentient beings to be free from suffering, renunciation is the determination to be free from suffering. So already there's a relationship, you see? And so what is the suffering that we're talking about? It's not the everyday suffering, although that's included. It's the deep fundamental cycle and negative patterns of samsara. This is what we want to get out of. And so in the meantime, what, we're, what we wind up doing, because that's quite a big ask, right? That's a big project, ending suffering for yourself, being liberated from suffering yourself, um, working to be of greatest benefit to all sentient beings, perfecting your potential of Buddhahood. That's a big ask. And we might kind of like that idea, but on the day-to-day -day level, what we wind up doing is often just like samsara symptoms relief. Yeah, what's sort of tangible? And we think, okay, well, what are the problems in the world? Okay, there's lots of poverty, there's lots of war, there's lots of natural disasters, there's homophobia, there's misogyny, there's a whole plastic issue, right? We know that this is what's up. And what can we do about it? And then, you know, you read the news and you look at lots of inspiring people and what winds up happening usually is, wow, that's a bit much, cup of tea, right? I want to do something, but there's just so much to be done, and where do I even start? And so the paralysis sort of sets in, and you know, so you try and make little plans that seem like, okay, here's something me as a little person can do, but again, it's an outside project, and you can never do it perfectly because you're not perfect, and you feel bad about it and lose momentum, right? So an example is, um, the other day I was getting on an airplane, and before getting on the airplane, I said to myself, ha-ha, plastic is a thing that I'm working on, right? Who's with me? We're all really on a plastic kick lately, right? We've been on it for years, but now we're super onto it, right? Plastic bad, plastic bad. So I was thinking to myself, okay, air travel is a classic time where there's tons of waste. I'm going to be a good kid and bring my own cup, and I'm going to eat really good breakfast so that I won't be tempted for the snacks that come around. Yeah gonna be a good person that's something right that's something so I get on the airplane and the um, flight attendant comes around with a drink and I'm like I have my own cup feeling slightly smug right <laughs> I have my own cup and I you know get my nice cup of tea subtly judging those around me who haven't planned ahead <laughs> right subtly judging them and then the snack comes around and I'm like I'm good feeling good right had a good breakfast yeah and then I, you know, then I land and I'm getting to the train and I've got a little bit of time before I um, get on the train and it's lunchtime and I realize there's no way I can get to a restaurant and have a proper meal on a plate in time to get on this plane. My choices are get a takeaway sandwich in a terrible plastic container or have no lunch. Oh no. <laughs> right? No lunch. No lunch is bad. Right? <laughs> And what was interesting is that, so I went ahead and I got myself a, lot, you know, a sandwich in a little plastic container and I felt so guilty about it. And immediately I started having all sorts of defensive thoughts as if someone was judging me. No one's around, it's just me by myself, right? It's just me by myself having a sandwich, feeling terribly guilty about having bought something that was in a plastic container. So I can feel all this justification arising in me, right? I could feel, look, I've got a busy job, I've got a busy week ahead, I need to stay nourished and sustained, okay? It's for the greater good. And I could feel myself saying, look, I don't always do this, this is just an occasional thing. Lots of people do this all the time, <laughs> right? Et cetera, et cetera, right? All this kind of nonsense that we say to ourselves. And what, what occurs to me in, in this just very small set of absurdities of the human condition is that as soon as you tell yourself a perfected ideal, you are doomed to fail. And then what happens is that because we sort of think we can live up to our own standards, when we don't, we get disillusioned and throw the baby out with the bathwater. So then what happened is then I had a coffee in a takeaway coffee cup, and I even had an extra cup. I even had the proper, like, my own cup. And I went and, like, bought a coffee forgetting that I had my own cup. And then I also got a cinnamon roll. 
in a bag, right? It was like the whole thing came crashing down, right? Things I didn't even need and had absolutely no way to justify. I did not need a coffee or a cinnamon roll. Perhaps there was an argument for the sandwich, right? right? And so this is what happens to us is that we set ourselves these impossible standards and then when there's a little crack, then it's like the whole thing falls apart and we're just completely back to slob land. Yeah, I mean, and this happens in lots of different forms, right? But along with it are the negative states of mind that are trying to protect our ego from being seen, yeah, and that are sort of trying to let ourselves off the hook and soften the blow so that we don't feel so bad about ourselves for not living up to this thing that we really do think is important and precious, yeah, and so what happens is that because we don't know what self-compassion really is, we soothe ourselves with negative states of mind. We soothe ourselves with justification and with defensiveness. Uh, we soothe ourselves by saying, it, you know, one, one thing doesn't make a big difference in the grand scheme of things, right? We soothe ourselves with all sorts of negative states of mind rather than saying, that was the wrong thing, next time I'll do the right thing, moving on. Yeah, that was the wrong thing, next time I'll do the right thing, moving on. Yeah, no, it, it doesn't have to be a whole story, right? But this is what happens because we don't know the nature of cyclic existence or even the nature of our own ability to change at what pace, yeah? Is that we make everything even harder for ourselves than it needs to be. So, you know, what, what can happen is that you're looking at the suffering of humanity and the suffering of the world and you get overwhelmed and paralyzed and unable to do anything. Or you become very distressed and very kind of like empathic distress um, you could call it upregulated, right? You see all of the tragedy and you start to feel down, even though you're in a beautiful state of, you know, a very nice safe country where, you know, everything is beautiful and things aren't going as bad as they could be. You know, somehow now you're feeling the suffering of the refugees or you're feeling the suffering of people under threat of the bushfires. You know, you're really over empathizing as if that's helping them. Like a good person should feel bad about this. Do you ever have that kind of story in your mind? A good person should feel bad about this. And so I'm going to watch this and feel bad about it. Because that helps. Yeah. And the thing is, you do need it to touch you to do something. But what is the way we let the suffering of others touch us? It has to be the correct way, a skillful way, combined with wisdom. Otherwise, it does lead to all this distress or all this paralysis. Or self-righteous kind of like, I am a savior of the world. I'm one person doing the right thing, but it's got such an eye to it, you become unbearable to be around, right? You become so full of um, ego that, um, sure, you might be helping in general, but gee, you're hell to live with, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, which is the classic tale of, you know, like the university student activist who has beautiful passions and beautiful ideals and is so has so much contempt for their parents that they haven't kind of held their standards, you know, and, and this kind of, you know, hubris of youth that, you know, probably all of us had a chapter of in our life at some point or the other. But it's not like it can't still come up when we are on a roll of doing the quote right thing. Yeah, you know, when you're on a roll, like with a diet, or you're on a roll with a, a new study program, or you're on a roll with a, a routine that you think of as really good and beneficial, and you really have some momentum for it, Often together with that momentum is a lot of judgment of others who aren't, yeah? And then when you crack and lose the momentum, there's all sorts of defensiveness about why it's only right that you lost gas, why it's only right that you, quote, failed, why it's only fair enough. Or you go into shame and humiliation and deception and don't want anyone to see that you failed, yeah? Do you, do you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> right? And so. None of this has anything to do with compassion for self or others. It's all just been a big ego trip in the name of being a good person. We're not to be blamed, right? No one taught us the right way to do it. And it's not like it was completely ineffective, all of our good things, all of our good deeds. It's not like it was completely a waste of time. At least we care, right? But the reason why it doesn't work and why we're so tired is the approach. So here's where we want to start looking at what is renunciation, really. The determination to be free from samsara 
means you need to understand what is samsara and what is freedom. So samsara is cyclic existence, but it's uncontrolled cyclic existence. Yeah, there are many sufferings in our existence, but the biggest one is our lack of control. What controls us is disturbing emotions, negative states of mind. And the first step is just acknowledging that despite my best intentions, the momentum of negative states of mind is stronger. So even a tiny snapshot of doing the right thing is a huge success that took many causes and conditions to come about. And so we're just so happy it happened without having this identity of I did it. Yeah, because when you are able to do the right thing, it's not because you did it all by yourself, right? You had so many conditions that supported it and whether um, you know, it was received well, so many conditions about whether it was received well, so then you're just happy good was done without the whole identity thing, which then leads to expectations and all that kind of garbage, right? So, okay, what is freedom really? Freedom is freedom from negative states of mind and the control they impose on us because of the strength of habit. So the first step is catching them in their tracks. Yeah, because if you can catch the negative state of mind as it's unfolding, you can hear the lie inside of it. If you're just going with the flow of your old habits and just kind of living your life without examining your reasons why, then you don't hear the nonsense you tell yourself. And those justifications and that defensiveness or that guilt and that shame starts to feel very logical and true and very hard to get rid of because you identify with it. So freedom, freedom, freedom. You just really sit with what is freedom? All right, well, we haven't experienced the true freedom of nirvana yet, but we've had moments of clarity and peace. Moments of clarity and peace when the negative states of mind have chilled out a little bit. They didn't have too much fuel. You haven't been feeding them too much. And your, your steady version of yourself, your rational version of yourself, your sanity was present. That, that gives you a flexibility of mind that you don't have at other times. So you start by wanting freedom from suffering by doing this comparing and contrasting of just your ordinary form that you have already so far experienced. And, and can you feel the difference between yourself in an afflicted, disturbed state of mind and yourself when you have your basic sanity kind of present? There's like a narrowing or an expanding of what you're able to cope with. There's a narrowing or an expanding of the possibilities open to you in terms of problem solving, in terms of creativity. When you're feeling steady and clear, together with that is a flexibility of mind. Yeah, plans can change and it not ruin your life. People can be rude and you can see it in a, in a greater context, right? People can be amazing and you cannot get fixated and attached to them. Stuff can move and flow when you're in that state of mind. And when you're really consumed by something like attachment or anger, pride or jealousy, the narrow completely focuses and it becomes all about you, which is not comfortable. It seems, it seems like a good idea, right? It seems like a good idea to look after yourself, but the way in which we look after ourselves makes our narrow focus really even more so. And what we call self-compassion winds up being self-cherishing. Yeah, and self-cherishing really is like narcissism on steroids, right? It's really like, uh, you know, I am the center of the universe. Even if at the center of the universe I'm miserable, it's still all about me. Yeah. And people are always doing something to me. They're always thinking about me. We're wondering about their motives and their opinions about me. When in fact, they probably didn't even remember, right? <laughs> You're not on their mind. They don't care. Right? They remember you when you're in front of them, right? Just like everyone else, right? You're not that important. But you know, the self-cherishing mind really thinks others are thinking about them actively a lot. It's the paranoid mind. It's the suspicious mind. Um, it's also the mind that wonders: Do people understand how amazing I am? Do they know? Yeah, they should know. 
do they respect me as much as I should be respected? Do they know who I am? Right? And it's sort of like doing uh, your CV of accomplishments in the back of your mind. Do they know that I've done this and this and this and this? Do they know that I've met this and this and this and this and I've traveled to this place and done this thing and had this education and that experience? Do they know? Because if they knew, they would know how amazing I am. That is also the self-cherishing mind, which is easily wounded. Right? That mind is so easily wounded. Because when it's, before it gets challenged, it feels like confidence. But because it's actually pride and not confidence, as soon as someone disrespects you, you take it like a wound. Yeah? Rather than, why would they know? Yeah? Why? And actually, am I that cool? Perhaps not, in the great scheme of things. How embarrassing. I'm just a regular person. <laughs> yeah? Um, when you're in the open, still mind, you can learn anything from anyone. People that are, quote, lower than you, people that are, quote, higher than you. You're kind of in the mood to just listen to people. As soon as you start having a negative state of mind present, you lose freedom. Can you feel what I'm talking about? So we all have these two versions in us, and they look different person to person. But what does it feel like when you lose freedom to be happy? That's what the freedom is. Freedom to be happy. Yeah. Yeah. Definition I've heard is true freedom is how we choose to be in the moment. And when we act habitually, when we act reactionally, we are in the chains of our own making. Yep, yep. It's a, the prison of habit. Yeah, the prison of habit. And, we, and yet we can also liberate ourselves through creating new habits. You know, it's, it's again just kind of hearing yourself and hearing your own absurdity when you're in the negative state of mind. Because if you can hear the absurdity, you can let it go. Yeah? But if you're identified with your own thoughts, if you really have an ownership of your own thoughts, if you really believe everything you say to yourself, then examining them in an objective way and saying, these ones are keepers and these ones are not, becomes impossible because they're all you. So saying some are useful and some aren't is like saying you keep some and cut out others and that will be painful and you know, harming you in some way. Which isn't true, but is what it feels like when you're very identified with how you think. Um, so, so this freedom, you know, we've already had tiny, tiny tastes of the difference between an active negative state of mind and a less active negative state of mind. The way there's a difference in our ability to be flexible. There, the way there's a difference in our ability to be happy. Yeah? Do you agree? And so... Where do thoughts come from? Where do habits come from? Where do negative states of mind come from? Karma. Yep. <clears throat> Certainly karma. Where does karma come from? Previous karma. Tricky. <coughs> true. True and tricky. Yep. <laughs> what's another way to call karma? What's, what's uh, yeah, what is it born from? What is making it? What is making karma? Action. Intention? Yes, intention. Yes, yeah, spe mm -hmm. action, specifically the mental action of intention is what's creating karma. And then what is experiencing karma? What part of you is experiencing the results of past karma? Is that a question? No. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say the eye. The eye in general, yeah, you could say that in a kind of general way. Um, but of all of your sort of mental states, this is a lower question really, um, it's, you know, what's really experiencing karma is feeling, right? So what's making karma is intention, and what's experiencing karma is feeling. And that's all working together with how we label things, yeah? And so of all of the mental factors that we could talk about, those three are really important to look at. Feeling, intention, and discrimination. Sometimes it's translated as recognition. The ability to discern between things, but also how we label them. And so if we are mislabeling things, then we will have an unfortunate intention arise, right? We will have a mistaken intention arise, and the mind will move towards things that are not useful, and then the speech and the body will do things that are not useful. And that will plant a seed on our continuum, which will then ripen as suffering. And the thing is, is then it ripens as suffering, a feeling of suffering. 
And we think that the feeling of suffering is directly related to what we're labeling right now, when in fact it's coming from what happened before. And even if you don't believe in karma, you do believe in habit, right? And you do believe that the past informs the present, right? That you don't come out with brand new behaviors out of the blue, unrelated to experiences in your life, right? We all believe that there's some kind of cause and effect at work, even if we wouldn't call it karma, do you reckon? Yeah, things don't just come out of nowhere spontaneously with no reason. There's got to be some sort of cause, right? You can't have an apple tree without an apple seed, right? They don't just kind of go poof, right? So if the cause, you know, if there's a cause, we want to look at what is that cause and where did it come from and how can I start to create new causes, but also how can I ripen old causes of a better type? And so we have to start getting patient with the time in between feeling of suffering and a new seed ripening as happiness. Mm -hmm. And start not being so obsessed with the surface conditions right in front of us. Mm -hmm. Because actually what we're experiencing now is not about now. What we're experiencing now is because of the past. Mm -hmm. And what, what we do with it now is what's creating our future. And this is, you know, karma 101 or even psychology 101. But the problem is, is that when we say, I need to just take care of myself right now, what you're doing are self-soothing things that are usually related to your senses. And your senses lie. Yeah. So, it's a, so if you're feeling really stressed and overworked and overburdened and really way too busy, and you need to, quote, relax, often the things we turn to are sensory relief, right? I need a comfy chair and a comfy snack and some sort of entertainment, you know, whatever it is. I need a certain kind of conversation or I need certain kind of space from people. Yeah, I need space or I need company, right? That will make me soothed. And we're so, you know, we're so different that we could have an equal feeling of need for totally opposite things. But that feeling of, I just need this to be happy, that is not freedom. That is not freedom because you've completely given power over to an activity or a behavior or a substance or a person when in fact it was internal states of mind that could bring you that relief and peace. So often when you say to yourself, I just need some space, it's because you need some mental space. And when I'm feeling really lonely and I want people around, it's really the, the thoughts in your head are not positive, useful ones. Yeah. So you're wanting other stimuli to bring that in. And so none of this should be shame-inducing. None of this should be like, oh my gosh, I'm even worse than I thought. All of this should be quite liberating because you realize I've had the power the whole time to create my happiness. The home renovation project never has to be finished for me to be happy. It could go endlessly and cost twice as much mm -hmm. and I could still be happy. Yeah, my, you know, <clears throat> my mother doesn't ever have to completely understand, love, and validate me for me to be happy. Ha! Huh, fantastic. <laughs> Tick, right? <laughs> People don't actually have to show or give me any respect for me to be happy. How much time would that save, right? Like, even just mirror time, like, fiddling with hair. Oh, who cares? All right, never mind, right? So, you know, it's easier said than done, and you don't want to, like, jump past your limits and then, again, have that backlash feeling, right? And that's what we're trying to really look at, too, with developing this freedom and this real self-compassion is to pace yourself with a sense of humor, yeah? And say, today, what are the things that I've said to myself that have ruined my peace? Yeah, and you can go back through the day when was I feeling happy? When was I feeling sad? What were my ways of thinking that might have had an influence on that? And you do your day review. And you can start to unpack. There's been a lot of habits that I've been doing for a lot of years that have kind of never really worked. But they worked enough for me to keep trying them because I didn't have an alternative. Yeah? And it's not like our self-soothing behaviors don't work at all. It's just they don't work as well as other practices could. And they would be fine if there was no cost. But as soon as you start looking to, for example, other people to give you happiness, then if they don't give you happiness, you're either disappointed in them or disappointed in yourself, angry at them or angry at yourself. If it was their job to make you happy, 
it's going to fail, right? Because even if they do everything perfectly, your conception of what perfect is changes moment to moment. Your appreciation of it changes moment to moment. And nobody is that consistent anyway. Yeah, so if you're putting all your eggs in one basket of this person's job is to make me happy, then you've given them all the power to make you happy or not. You're, you've lost all of your power, right? If you said, I need this kind of career with these kind of coworkers and this kind of respect and this kind of status, then you can't be happy without those things. Yeah, but if those were just kind of things you were looking at to see if they were useful or not, it becomes a whole different way of living. Yeah. But, you know, if you're going through a normal day, just thinking, what are the times when I took a hit? My happiness took a hit. Yeah, you were kind of happy and content, do to do and then your happiness took a hit. What are the sort of like everyday things that happen that kind of like knock the wind out of your sails? Often to do with humans, right? Often. But like, you know, if you're just having a cruisy day and then not happy, what, what are the things that make you not happy? Behavior. Yeah? Whose? Because you did something that you shouldn't have and you feel bad about it, or? Yeah. yeah. Or not enough. Yeah, yeah, or not enough of a good not thing. Yep. Yeah. Yep, yeah, that's definitely a big one, not living up to our own expectations. Yeah, and, and that's where it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating paradox, but that to have an aspiration that is, I want to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings and know that you're doomed to fail but to do it anyway, right? To say the purpose of my life is to be of benefit to others. I promise to work to be to be of benefit to others and know that you're lying, but do it anyway. Yeah. So how do you go with, I mean, most Buddhist traditions have, you know, this very kind of concrete structure and this is somehow it, the message is to aspire to this. Yeah. And, and then people go, Ah, oh, but this is what I'm up to. Yeah. And fill that incredible gap. And, and then there's all these negative dysfunctional things that we do. Absolutely. In response to that, rather than perhaps forgiving ourselves or... Absolutely. Or just baby steps in that direction or whatever, but yeah. I mean, it's because, there's, I think it's because there's this huge gap between what we're able to intellectually understand and what we're actually able to do with consistency, yeah. you know? What we're actually able to do with consistency is so much smaller than what we can process and what we can understand intellectually. I mean, even something as simple as trying to change your diet, right? If your doctor told you you need to cut out potatoes for whatever reason, right? If you're really used to potatoes, um, it's hard to remember. And you start seeing them everywhere. Oh my God, there are potatoes everywhere. You know, it's a whole thing, right? And then you want, oh, I ate them again. Crap, I'm a terrible person. My doctor's going to be mad at me. Just that small. Never mind, like, working on your anger. Just, like, trying to cut potatoes out of your life, right? Um, you know, and so the thing is, is that you might completely be on board with what the doctor said. Say they were some Ayurvedic doctor and they said, you know, I don't know, there's a kidney issue related to potatoes or whatever they say, right? There's some, there's some, you know, genuine reason why this is not good for you or there's an allergy and you're like on board with it. You believe them, you agree, and you want to. That is still not enough to make you consistent in your behavior right off the bat, Unless you'd had a huge amount of habit momentum energy about your health preceding that, and this was just the final thing you needed to change the behavior. You know, some people quit smoking 10 or 15 times before they actually do, and some people quit the very first time they try. It's not because you have amazing champion people and really um, crap ones that never get their act together. It's that the momentum preceding the choice was different. The mental momentum preceding the moment of truth was different. So that creates a difference in how strong the behavior changes. And so, you know, when I say um, have the highest aspiration and know that you will fail, <laughs> make a definitive, powerful choice and promise and know that you're lying, there is a way to approach that because you, it's not actually as hypocritical as it seems because really on the end of that is yet right? Yet. And if you're having the yet, then you start to understand your own pacing. And the problem is, is that because we understand what is possible before we're actually able to do what is possible, 
that, that critical gap starts to be a place of shame. And that place of shame or guilt or whatever it is becomes a place where all sorts of even worse negative behaviors arise, probably even worse than when we met a spiritual path. Sometimes regular people with no particular religion are much nicer than religious people, right? Sometimes people that are atheists are far more ethical than people that are spiritual, right? But there's a difference because partially the pressure they put on themselves is different. As soon as you identify as someone working on themselves, you start to see how much work there is to do, right? And you're like, oh, good heavens. And then, the, you know, and then the shame flood of, wow, this is much worse than I thought, <laughs> right? It was that way before you noticed it. Your friends and family were suffering from it before you noticed it, right? It's not new, but it's the, it's the you know, it's the cringe of, you know, like um, if you get a new glasses prescription and you look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, oh, dear, right? <laughs> you had that face before you saw it, <laughs> right? It's just now you've got a good prescription and you're like, I am getting older, <laughs> right? It was there before you saw it, right? And so uh, with the spiritual path, the lag time, that, that point at which you realize you are not living up to what you're, cognitive, what you're conceptually able to process, to be able to breathe in that space and acknowledge it without giving up, that it's hard. It, it takes a very robust, courageous state of mind. It takes a lot of bravery to say, I want to become perfect and I can become perfect, but today I'm still crap and that's fine because neither the perfection or the crap is completely under my own control. There are so many causes and conditions influencing both to over-identify with either is nonsense. Yeah, which is you know another place where our compassion gets all confused is that we have an idea of what should work when we're trying to be of benefit to ourselves and others, but we don't have the whole story. Yeah, we don't have the whole story. So sometimes we are not successful. It's not because we're not good people and don't have compassion. It's that we didn't have enough pieces to make the kind of decision that was going to help. Yeah, we just had a limited amount of, I don't know, just a limited amount of context, a limited amount of history, a limited amount of intelligence, whatever it is. But we don't know the whole story, so sometimes we fail. It's not our failure alone, and when we succeed, it's not our success. You know, it's not our success alone. And so, I guess as soon as you can take identity out of the picture of your progress, then you can be a bit more relaxed with it. Yeah, that any forward momentum was a collaborative effort, and any backslide was a collaborative effort, even if it didn't seem like an intentional collaboration. Yeah. And when you're doing really well and you're on a roll and you're feeling, this is the way I want to live my life now. I'm so happy that I'm living my life this way now. You have to know in the back of your mind, there will come a bad day when you will lose momentum. And that does not make you bad. But what happens is that as soon as you interrupt the momentum of a good run, it's so easy to then just chuck it all out and almost revert to a state worse than you started, almost as an act of rebellion. Yeah. To hell with being perfect. I'm going to be twice as bad. This is nonsense. <laughs> right? It happens because of the pressure we put on ourselves. It has to pop out somewhere. So, so really becoming conscious of what is a sustainable pace. You know, you have to experiment and go too far and go too slack and just kind of find that equilibrium of day to day, this amount of effort is a sustainable amount knowing that each day your physical energy is different, your mental energy is different, the tasks that need to be done in the day are different, and so you can't make hard and fast, tight plans and hold yourself to them. But you can still sort of make them lightly, because if you make none at all, then there is no mo momentum forward, right? And so it's like how to make plans that are doomed to failure, but make them anyway. Because still, it creates a habit of this is what I'm about. And then you look back 10 years and you say, there has been some progress. I'm a little nicer, a little happier than I used to be. Yeah, I'm a little further along on my spiritual path than I used to be. And 
if I'm not, it's not the fault of the path. It's been the fault of my approach to it, but still not even my fault, just a fault in approach, meaning I didn't have enough pieces. And, and so when you meet, um, this is always the poignant thing that you meet at, in spiritual communities of any kind or religious communities of any kind is the um, fervent, uh, sort of glassy-eyed, fanatic, newly converted look, yeah? Um, which is off-putting, right, um, for those around them, um, especially other new people who have not adopted the glassy-eyed persona. They're like, I don't know if I should come here. Oh, God. You know, and you kind of get a kind of a culty, weird vibe, and you get scared. But the thing is, is about the, the, the fervor that happens when you meet something you know has potential. So whether you got sort of weird and fanatical yourself, there, there is a great joy and momentum in finally meeting a path that you think is possible. And there's some energy in that first few moments, yeah? And there's an old saying, right? Zen mind is beginner's mind. And there's a beautiful momentum in being a beginner, having newly met something you know has potential to work. The thing is, is what do you do when the dark night of the soul occurs, when you finally realize what might actually be possible for you as an individual, given the conditions you came in with? Can you still have forward momentum and not just dissolve back into a blob of slobness and just, you know, hedonistic indulgence, saying to hell with it because I can't be perfect this life. I'm going to just have fun, screw it, and have more plastic. Yes. <laughs> Mind you, all, Thich Nhat Hanh says he has the beginner's mind. Yeah. yeah. Or, or it's so important. Absolutely. And even the beginner's mind in the sense of who am I today, you know, and the expectations you have on yourself. You know, if you, again, if you get ahead of steam, you start to think of yourself as advancing, and that can become a trap, right? Because it is sometimes two steps forward, three steps back. It's not like a linear thing, this progress. But the thing that's really helpful is the habit of seeking, the habit of having a goal that you aspire to, the having a worldview that you believe in and have a commitment to, and just continuously saying to yourself, try again, just try again, just try again. And, you know, failure is only when you've given up. It's not having made the mistake or done it unskillfully. Yeah, it's when you've thrown the baby out with the bathwater and, and kind of given up on yourself as well as the path. And, and this can happen if in the you know, early times of meeting a spiritual path, you're so gung-ho um, that eventually you kind of run out of steam and then revert back to a worse state. It can happen. Yeah. Or um, it's almost like you want to have an argument with the spiritual path that you chose because you're not able to live up to it. And so you have like this rebellion as if the spiritual path is a parent and you are a teenager. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, well, I'm going to drink even more to hell with this no drinking vow, you know, or um, I'm going to be even more... Um, uh, bold and critical because people need an honest truth right to hell with this right speech nonsense I'm going to tell it like it is and you sort of like feel the pride of being one of those people who's direct when in fact you're just being mean <laughs> right <laughs> you know this can happen right because you put all this pressure on yourself to be perfect found out you can't be perfect right away and then are mad at yourself in the path so this isn't skillful right but it's normal and it happens because we're just trying to find and regulate how much we can do day by day. So self-compassion is also understanding impermanence. Yeah, the changeability of yourself. Yeah, the, the, how different you are day to day, how different the conditions are day to day. And with this person today trying your best, not comparing it to yesterday's person. Yeah, the, the best I can do for today's person is this. Could be way more, could be way less than the day before, but today's person is doing this mount. Yeah, and that it's, it's mental, it's not physical, although it can have physical manifestations. Yeah, that to be a very generous person means a pure intention to give. It doesn't mean giving away all your money. Yeah, to have pure generosity has, is a really solid intention to give. To have solid ethics is to refrain from negative actions that are harmful. It doesn't mean that you're preachy, <laughs> you know, all, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Being patient doesn't mean that you 
allow bad behavior or become a doormat or, I don't know, become kind of um, airy-fairy sort of, it's fine, everything's fine, in a kind of passive way, right? It means that you have forbearance with suffering, meaning your mind is not disturbed in the face of suffering. Not that you don't do anything to alleviate it, yeah? But the, the first step is connecting with that balance. So renunciation means that you are looking at the big picture and the whole spectrum of why and how suffering comes about, and you are determined to break the cycle every time you catch it. So it's almost like you're breaking the cycle of samsara in every moment. And any moment that you have mindfulness to catch yourself is kind of cr making a crack in the giant wheel of your existence. And this is what we really want to be working on. And this is, you know, effort that's worthwhile. So then when we see suffering like on the news, the suffering of others, we have the right framework for it, which is these things are tragic. I want to be of benefit, but it's not about me. These things are tragic, I want to be of benefit, but also this is their karma ripening. And the very same thing could happen to me. So, you know, if I'm identifying with it, I have to identify with it in the correct way, which is what are the things that bring about these disasters and these tragedies, and am I eliminating them within myself as an individual? Yeah? If you're, you know, feeling judgmental about the anger and hatred and lack of tolerance in the Middle East, but not working on your own relationship with your neighbors, hypocrisy, right? Um, and where does this kind of peaceful activity start? It's always grassroots stuff where small groups of people intentionally try and live better and support each other to do that, and then it has a ripple effect, and enough little pockets of that creates the kind of momentum we need for change. And so you have to start with yourself. Yeah, you have to start with yourself. And really, as soon as you notice yourself becoming distressed about what's happening in the world, to come back and make it very personal and check, am I creating the cause for any of this in my behaviors now? That is my project. And then also, it creates the right kind of empathy that's not judgmental when you see bad things happen. Because suffering can be an amazing blessing in terms of killing your pride. It's very hard to have pride when you're struggling. Yeah, it's very easy to have pride when things are doing well, going well, as if you somehow deserve it or you've earned it or something. Yeah, you know that saying that if hard work was a guarantee of um, success in money, then all women in Africa would be billionaires, right? <laughs> you know, so it's, it's the idea that just because we have a good circumstance now that we're entitled to it, that we're, we deserve it, no, it's the coming together of many causes and conditions, none of which we really have ownership of. We're really bloody lucky, is what we are. Yeah, and so we have the space and opportunity to look into things deeply that other people might not have because the conditions haven't come together, not because they're not able to. So if we have the conditions to and we don't, we are letting down the world a little bit. We sure are. But if sometimes we forget, that's only human. So it's, it's that very delicate balance, isn't it? Of really holding yourself to a standard without punishing yourself for not being perfect. Yeah, about really having this strong intention every single day to develop into your fullest potential, while at the same time realizing that this is a lifetimes long path that I wanna enjoy the process of. Yeah, I want to be hungry for transformation. And I want to be hungry for self-awareness, even if that self-awareness comes with a bit of a cringe, that the more self-aware you become, the more tricky <laughs> you realize this is going to be, the more complex you realize your motivations are, and how unpure many of your intentions have been. Yeah, to be able to see that with clear eyes and a sense of humor and keep going anyway. That's compassion for yourself, right? And that's going to be a way that you can also be compassionate to others. So to have compassion for others, you need to have compassion for yourself. To have compassion for yourself, you need to be able to sit with your layers of suffering and neuroses bravely and figure them out. Otherwise, the compassion you bring to others is going to be loaded with judgment.
and it's it's not going to be coming from the right place. So because it's not coming from the right place, it's not going to land as effectively. Yeah, it might still be of some use. It's not like it's of no use, but you can feel the difference, right, when you're on the receiving end of compassion, when it's coming from someone who really both sees how much you're struggling and sees your potential to be free of it. Yeah, someone who's being compassionate toward you also respects you. You feel that respect, that they can both see you're doing it tough, but this is not all that you are. Yeah, as opposed to pity, which is like, you poor bugger, how'd you get yourself into that mess? Yeah, I'd never do that. That feels horrible, right? Even if the person is saying the right things, even if they have a nice face when they're doing it, if they're pitying you, oh, it makes it worse, doesn't it? So we, we can't really know how things are landing for other people, but we can start to really work on, is it coming from the best possible place from here out? Yeah, they might still hear it the wrong way, but at least it's not coming from the wrong place. Yeah. And the nicest thing you can do for yourself is to stop thinking about yourself, <laughs> right? One of the nicest things you can do, not go have a holiday, not go to the spa, not get a massage, no recreational acupuncture, is to just stop thinking about yourself so much, <laughs> right? That's the nicest thing you can do. It's a, lot of, it's a lot of pressure to put on one sentient being, all this focus, all this attention just on one sentient being trying to navigate all their various little random ego-based needs. As soon as you start thinking about other people, it is a huge relief. And this is something you prove to yourself experientially, right? You don't have to take the Buddha's word for it or my word for it, anyone's word for it. It's how do you feel after a day where you haven't really thought about yourself that much? You got yourself fed and watered, right? You got yourself clothed and cozy, and then you just got on with it, and you're happy at the end of that day. When you had work that was fulfilling, you felt connected to your fellow man, you know, what else is really needed for happiness? Yeah, so as soon as you start thinking, oh, how can I be happy? How can I be happy? What's the best way to get happy? Okay, your needs actually get more and more specific. Yeah, they start closing in on you um, because you're coming from this ego place which actually can never be satisfied. Yeah, when you're coming from the neurotic place, even if you do, quote, look after yourself, you start getting very precious. Yeah, I can only have this food at this time with these people and this level of noise on these kind of chairs with this weather. It gets very specific, right? And if any of those things are wrong, the day is ruined. Yeah, and when you're thinking of others, you're just happy to have a seat. Yeah, you're happy that food is there. And you can actually quite sincerely enjoy it. Um, so you just, you know, again and again, thinking about your rational mind, thinking about your less rational mind, and consciously lifting yourself out of that narrow view and plunking yourself back into the wisdom place and then expanding that more and more and more. So, uh, you know, we can do this when it's worth our time, but we forget to do it on ordinary days. But if we do it on ordinary days, it's going to come more and more easily. And then in the big moments, we're really going to be in the best position to be of some use. And that really familiarization is really meditation. Just do it again and again and again. It becomes the way you are. So, do you have any questions or arguments? You used the word lucky before. Mm. Not something I would expect to hear. Yes. It makes it sound like it's random. Certainly it's not random. Certainly it's not random. But better to think luck than I deserve it. Yeah? Mm. When good things are happening, mm. better to think lucky than I'm really entitled to this, right? It's, it's an interesting, no, I, and I see where you're going. And, you know, it's not like it's random. It's certainly not random when good things happen. We created the cause for good things to happen. Through our actions of body, speech, and mind that were motivated in a positive way, we created the cause to live in a beautiful, safe country where we're able to practice whatever we want. But to say we're lucky 
we are lucky in a sense that we could have met with conditions for our other seeds to ripen. Mm -hmm. You know, we very likely have the seeds to be born in a place where there's a lot of religious oppression, where there's a lot of discrimination, where perhaps if we were a certain gender, we would have far less rights, where et cetera, et cetera, could happen. We have the seeds for that in our continuum because we have intolerance in our mind, mm -hmm. yeah? If you, you know, if you think, oh, I could never be born in that situation because I'm not that kind of person, that is a lie, right? We've gotten up to all sorts of nonsense, yeah? So it's, it's not like luck in the sense of spontaneous, random, un, without cause, but it's fortunate. Mm. It's fortunate that we met with the right conditions mm. for our positive karma to ripen. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so maybe luck is, is the wrong word, mm. fortunate. Very I don't fortunate. think when something good happens that I deserve it. Mm. I've caught myself enough times now, I think, oh, I've earned it. Earned, interesting, uh, yeah. And be grateful yeah. and hoping that it will happen again. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, earned is a more accurate term. And it is accurate to say earned in one sense, except for the connotation it brings. Because earned starts to feel like deserve, feels to, no, starts no, to feel like entitled. No, don't go in that direction. Yeah? Yeah. 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 You know, and to say earned also has a connotation of more ownership than is really there. Mm, okay. You know, because anything good that we've done was supported. Mm -hmm. You know, and the, and the problem is, is that when we've done the right thing, it so quickly turns into I did the right thing rather than there was someone there to benefit, there were people there who taught me how, there was the resources in order to, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. All these things came together for, for a good thing to happen that I was instrumental in. I'm so happy that happened, but I didn't do it really mm -hmm. by myself. Yeah. And you know, and the, the, it's interesting to put it in the, in the framework of the positive, because in the negative, it can really help your guilt, shame, horribleness, right? Mm -hmm. If something terrible has happened and you think, I earned this, yeah, well, <laughs> right? It, it is the same thing. It, it, you know, there's a difference between, um, I guess, taking responsibility and attributing ownership. Yeah. And yeah. It's, a, it's a fine line, and maybe the connotation of the words are different in our minds. So however you're playing with it in your mind, mm -hmm. you know, if you're getting to the, the right point, doesn't matter what words you use, really. But it's like, responsibility means because it's here, I have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Ownership means it's either uh, something I've earned or it's my fault, which has a lot more kind of ego danger in it and a less awareness of kind of interdependence. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so you just kind of sit with it a little bit. But, yeah, you know, you can still use the same words, but just kind of like, hmm. Because it's so easy to slip into also a feeling of, I have a right to this. Yeah. That's because I earned it. That. Yeah. Because yeah. I earned it, I have a right to it. Yeah, and people better give it. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah. It's tricky, isn't it? It's tricky because also even if we're not really thinking about karma, if we start just thinking, I'm a good person, why are people mean to me, right? Don't you have that thought sometimes? I'm a nice person, why are people mean to me? Or I'm, um, uh, I'm of a certain age or I'm of a certain education level, why aren't I getting respect? Yeah, we get, we get that a lot, right? Like I've earned whatever it is kind of response from other people. Well, yeah, the ones you don't like too, <laughs> right? Both. So, you know, kind of this feeling of earned, it can, it can load it with more ego. Um, but maybe not. Maybe it depends on the person. Mm. Well, actually, depends you on the person. interesting just before, because mm. I said, I, I feel like I earned it, putting mm. the emphasis on earned, and then you said, I earned it. And I went, ooh. It's the I was the problem. Yeah. Maybe the earned wasn't the problem. Yeah. It was the that was I. a different meaning. Mm. Definitely. And, you know, and it's a day-by-day -day thing, right, of, of kind of how you're processing what's, quote, happening to you as opposed to what's happening from you. Yeah. What's happening from you is very much inviting what's happening to you, and yet we kind of go the other way around. And, yeah. I sort of like earned in the sense of, yeah, okay, somewhere back there I created the causes. Mm. As long as I don't slip into that is all I've earned. Yeah. As long yeah. as I remember, yes, I have also, in that sense, earned all kinds of horrific stuff. Yeah. And, and because assumption seems, tends to be, I think, 
this is this is something really good happening for me because I've earned it. Mm. And that's all I've earned, good stuff. Whereas you are the people over there have earned bad stuff. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Rubbish. Yeah, or, yeah. you know, lots of people are kind of in the... Um, opposite headspace of you know all these terrible things that happen to it and it's only fair because i'm a rotten person you know and they over identify with the bad that's kind of heaped on top of them and you know it's it's so difficult when you're um trying to train in compassion um and you see people who are suffering needlessly because of the way they think mm -hmm. because you can't inject them with your process mm -hmm. right but you know if you've seen a very very depressed friend you know, someone in a real bad state, a lot of what they're saying starts with I, mm. right? And why don't people, and why can't people just, and what is wrong with people, and why don't under, people understand that I, that I, that I, and there is so much I in the way that they're speaking externally and internally to themselves, no doubt, and it's creating this prison of sadness yeah, it's creating a prison of sadness, but you can't tell them that when they're in the in the worst of it, right? It just adds fuel to the fire. One more person who doesn't understand me, you know? Isn't that just the way people are, right? But once you've lifted out of it, you can kind of look back at yourself and, and realize that it was a prison of your own creation because of your expectations of the way others should be based on how you are right now as opposed to an awareness of the past, yeah? your past and their past, yeah? So, for example, if you're expecting people to be kind to you because you are kind to them, that does sound reasonable in the wisdom of the world, but it actually isn't the whole story. If you're kind to someone and they're not kind to you, you know, you feel kind of outraged, right? Like, if you were really rude and they're rude back, later in the day you go, oh, fair enough, I was a bit rude too, fair enough. You can kind of, like, make peace with it, right? But what about those times when you really were a good person doing the right thing and people were mean to you anyway? How dare they, right? And, you know, the way we soothe ourselves is to say things like, here's why I was good and they were bad, La laundry list of both, right? Here's why I was right and they were wrong, laundry list of both, until we feel soothed and are able to move on. And maybe if we're like evolved, right, then we think, oh, and they were struggling. Here's how they were struggling, poor bugger. They just didn't understand that I was trying to do the right thing. Yeah, if we're evolved, right? But we don't go even deeper to say, actually, the very fact that they weren't kind to me was my seed ripening. Yeah, that was my seed ripening. And actually, in a way, their bad behavior with me as a condition, I could see as almost, it's my fault they behaved badly. Which is so tricky, right? Because, you know, you can very easily get into some sort of victim-blaming, unfortunate psychology with this, right? If you're coming at it from the wrong angle. Yeah? You see how you could go the wrong way with this. But this is all stuff that you're doing internally to take the power back from the way you view circumstance. Yeah, Is it more empowering to think that people are randomly unkind to you for no reason, no matter what you do, or to think, I created the cause for this, let me create the cause for something else? Which is more empowering in your mind? What is more useful in functioning with the world? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Just going a bit back to the and what have you, I was trying to think of how the Buddha talked about. I don't think he talked much about gratitude on Mm. I think it's very wrong. He talks about fortunate, like a precious human rebirth and so on. But to me, in a non-discriminatory way, mm. just I feel great gratitude for Absolutely. those things we've been talking about. And Absolutely. I don't know where they came from. <laughs> absolutely. Just, yeah, absolutely. And gratitude is huge. Yeah. Look, we do talk about it a lot in the Mahayana. It's less talked about in the Theravadan traditions. Mm. Um, in the Mahayana, there's very much the practice of be grateful to everyone. It's one of the mind training slogans of Geshe Chikawa, be grateful to everyone. Um, because those who are kind to you are showing you the benefit of kindness, how nice kindness is, are adding to your worldly happiness. Those who are unkind to you are showing you this is the fault of unkindness, helping you develop empathy for other people who are struggling, etc., etc., helping build your patient skills, whatnot, exhausting your negative karma. So being grateful to everyone is a huge practice. And, and it's, a, it's a good way to live in this world, isn't it? You know, it's a very peaceful way to live in this world. 
and it helps you not be so reactive. Yeah? And so, so this very delicate thing in our mind of how we're speaking to ourselves to maintain equilibrium and kindness while at the same time being proactive in this world to minimize the harm that we see, rather than the other way around. Yeah, normally we look at the world and look at how can we minimize the harm that we see? How can we fix the world? How can we fix relationships? How can we fix each other? How can we get things comfortable? How can we get our resources in order? And then we will be happy. It's the wrong direction. It's practical and it makes sense and some of that is necessary, but it would be much more effective to start with getting internal peace sorted and then actually your external projects become far more efficient. Yeah, and you wind up needing less of the frivolous ones just naturally. Then renunciation doesn't become about giving up anything. It becomes freeing yourself of the need of them, which is a totally different way to view it. Giving up the need of them freeing yourself from the need of them. Yeah. You know, I mean, really, think, think about when you've done this in the simplest of ways, right, of all of the things you think you need in your house. Yeah, all of the things you look to for comfort in your house. And then when you go on holiday, suddenly you don't need them. Yeah. And you're kind of freed from the burden of looking after them. Yeah. It could be in a epoxy hotel room, but if it's Italy, you don't care because you've decided Italy is happiness, right? <laughs> if you've decided Italy is horrible and oppressive and full of rude people, then Italy is horrible and oppressive and full of rude people. If you've decided it's full of kind, artistic, Mediterranean sorts and gorgeous views, then that's what it's full of. You know, it's all been what your mind has done. But before leaving, you thought, I really need to be comfortable, squashy armchair, you know, excellent bedside table, good lighting, right? Solid fixtures, <laughs> etc. whatever your need list is. Yeah, but then when you go on holiday, you can sort of like enjoy the character of the faucet falling off. You wouldn't enjoy the character of the faucet falling off in your own house, but when you're on holiday, you're like, oh, isn't it quaint? <laughs> yeah. Oh, look at the chipping tiles, it's so beautiful. Yeah, you don't look at that in your own house. Right, but it shows you that you can, and it shows you that it was never really about the external, it was always about the attitude you brought to it, and you ruined your own happiness with the attitude you brought to your own dropping off faucet and chipping tiles. Yeah. 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 Um, any any um, other questions or comments? I'd just like to make a quick comment. I find myself, the more I practice expecting the unexpected mm. in a joyful way it's just sort of saying i don't know from what direction something's going to spring up in the day but it's just that moment when you feel that tremendous happiness it can just be something last i give the hens yeah how look i get from that's watermelon i've never had that before wow but it's the unexpected, and yeah. it's, but it's sort of, I'm not quite sure about the expectation of the unexpected. Yeah. I do <laughs> yeah. sort of think, I wonder what today will show up. Yeah. It may throw up nothing. Yeah. That was unexpected. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, yeah. that's true. I'm not, yeah. yeah. But it's, but yeah, it's no, a new you. place for me. Yeah. It's rather than saying, I expect the day to go like this. <clears throat> yeah. It's, I'm more able to sort of muddle along and then try not to have those huge expectations. But when that little one, it could just be a stamen falling off a plant. Mm. And it just blows your mind. Yeah. yeah like it, there's room for delight. Mm. Yeah, there's room for delight. And it's, it, it is tricky to get yourself into that headspace when you're not in the mood for it. You can't mm. force it, can you? Yeah, try and be delighted. Get delighted. You're in a really bad mood, and you're like, find wonder in the world. <laughs> you know, no, that's not going to work. Right? But, um, but when you are in that state, how beautiful it is, right, to kind of release yourself from that expectation and to kind of be able to be surprised in a happy way. That is the flexibility of mind, you know, that we're talking about, for sure. And, you know, it's it, noticing what are the ways in which we start to darken and, and ruin the joy without kind of going into I'm bad for having slipped out of my delight 
or I'm bad for having slipped out of my sense of wonder, you know, to go, inevitably darkness will descend. It's, it is just weather passing by. How can I even find some delight in darkness, you know, and some way to really understand the human condition through this? Um, sometimes you can even have a, a negative state of mind catch you off guard, one that you don't have very often. Say you're normally an anger person, but today it was attachment. Or normally you're an attachment kind of person, and today it was jealousy. You know, you can almost even have delight if you have enough objectivity from your own experience to go, oh, this is what jealousy is like. I'm not usually jealous, but this mm -hmm. is what it's like. No wonder that friend of mine who's always jealous is suffering so much. I have a new depth of compassion for her knowing what this does to my mind. So of course I don't want to feed it and I don't want to go into it, but now I have tasted something I hadn't yet really noticed. It's opening me up to another level of the human experience, which is going to make me even less judgmental and more kind and present with people. You know, so even when it's like it's not what you wanted, it's even when it's a negative state of mind, there's a way of keeping that same kind of, all right, how is this useful? because there's a way to make it useful. And, um, and, and that is a tricky thing of if you're identified as someone working on their spiritual path and you have big negative states of mind arise, it's way more embarrassing than if you hadn't identified as someone on a spiritual path, right? If you're just an ordinary schmo walking down the street getting grumpy, it's to be expected everyone gets grumpy, yeah? It's, people make whole projects of whinging, right? And talking about all the things wrong with the world then if you're trying to live differently and you find those same habits arising, it becomes this embarrassing thing that you need to somehow justify or conceal, right? Makes you all tangled inside, right? But there's a whole other way of looking at it, which is how good it is to notice what this is like once again, because the vividness of it happening right now will remind me not to go there again. If it hadn't happened in 5, 10, 15 years, I might forget how bad it is and not be so vigilant. But oh, this is what happens when I let myself get ahead of steam with my anger. Look at how it ruins my day. That's great information. <laughs> you know, I wish it hadn't happened, but that is good information. But you know, you'll notice then the next time you meet a really, really angry person, you are softer with them in the right way, not in a passive way, but in a heart softened way. Cause you're like, oh, yep, that place, I know that place. That is a horrible place. Not, that's a horrible place that I have no relationship to and don't understand, but I wish you well. <laughs> it's quite different, isn't it? Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that's a bit, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. The observation is so important, isn't it? Because I find, when I get angry, I find it quite an opportunity. I actually feel that anger. It's an incredible energy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't have to act on it. But yeah. when you feel it, it's, it's, it's quite remarkable. Absolutely. And you know, what would happen if you could have that energy without the wish to harm and use it in a right. different way? And I mean, we get so much work done. <clears throat> Absolutely. And you know, the way. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. You become numb and quite isolated from it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Or, or get a lot of shame around it or become deceptive about it being there or all these things happen. And, you know, there's just, there's a whole, you know, can of worms in our mental continuum that could pop out. And, you know, the practice really is being consistently with may I become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings, or may I take this on the path to transformation, may I use this as a way to open my heart, whatever arises, happiness or suffering, whatever I experience, kindness or unkindness, all of this is fuel for my path, all of it is useful. And, you know, I can call myself a practitioner if there is effort. Right? If there is any kind of effort to try and use it, even if I don't use it in the best way, if there's any kind of effort to see it from a bigger view rather than just my own personal experience of discomfort, I can be a practitioner. That is a practitioner, right? It's trying to move with each thing that arises and not against it and not kind of with a blocking attitude. But, you know, just every, every moment in time, just try and think, how can I minimize harm? How can I maximize benefit? 
in tiny, tiny ways, in big, beautiful ways, whatever, but just each moment, what are the conditions I have to work with? And, you know, then your life is fun <laughs> and connected and, you know, enriching and invigorating. And, you know, rather than everything being a hassle that's preventing your path, you know, everything is your path, right? Um, Penny? No, I was just trying to follow that, that thought through. Um, if I'm a practitioner, because I am practicing, because I haven't got there, so therefore, if I've got there, I can't be a practitioner, because I wouldn't need to practice anymore. That would be a Buddha. Yeah. Done. So, the fact that uh, I need to be by identifying as a practitioner reinforces it attracts us and I haven't got there yet. Yep. So, sorry, uh, that's just a slow train of thought. No, I'm no, no, I'm with you. I'm with the, tra you. the train is still trying to chug along, but it's, 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 all right. it's pretty slow today. No, yeah. no, it's all right. We're all, we all have a cold brewing or something. I don't know. It's... um. It, you know, also, I think when we talk about the five paths, you know, the first of the five paths um, to enlightenment, the gateway or the entryway to a real pathway awareness is uncontrived renunciation. That is the very first thing we need in terms of actual path, right? And if we're Mahayana practitioners, we want renunciation combined with bodhicitta, the wish to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. That is the beginning. The end of the path, the fifth path, is called the path of no more learning. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a beautiful way mm -hmm. to describe Buddhahood. It's the path of no more learning, which means up until that point, mm -hmm. yeah. you are learning. Learn, yeah. Which takes huge pressure off of you for thinking you ever need to be an expert, or you ever need to be, mm -hmm. quote, successful, or there needs to be some sort of um, tangible evidence of your progress. Well, you're learning, so... That's what you're doing. <laughs> you're learning. You don't have to be an expert. Um, you won't be an expert until you're a Buddha. And so the pressure's off, right? <laughs> it's, it's quite a relief, really. So again, it's that beginner's mind. But you know, to identify as a beginner all the way up until the end gives you that kind of space and freedom to experiment with momentum, experiment with pacing, and to try and enjoy the process. And that's the huge piece that will keep us coming back to the spiritual path, life after life, is if we find a way to enjoy it. Yeah? Because if we push ourselves too far and too fast and pop a fuse, we'll have fear and aversion to a spiritual path. Yeah. Right? And if we are completely lazy and hedonistic and just indulge in every sensory enjoyment out there, inevitably the novelty will wear off and will descend into darkness. Right? Because we tried all of these things that are supposed to make us happy, and then they eventually didn't, so then what? Yeah? If we have just had the right kind of balance of effort and rest, of spacing and humor, of discipline, but also the right pace for our discipline, then we're going to want to do this again and again. Yeah? Life after life. So, you know, what is your own kind of middle way is, is something you can only know experientially by trial and error. But both trial and error are parts of the puzzle that can be quite fun. Oh, that didn't work. Push that too far. Okay. Oh, that didn't work. I was a bit too slack. All right. It's something to learn, you know, like that. And it helps you out of, get out of competition, too, with your peers. Yeah, because that's, that's another way that we ruin our happiness. Yeah, we ruin our happiness by comparing ourselves to each other, forgetting that we each have such an individual set of conditions. And what progress looks like is going to vary so much. And progress in one area might mean a gap in another. And so kind of thinking people will be consistent, yeah, thinking that people will be reliable, <laughs> thinking that someone should be at a certain point after a certain number of years, you start, you stop shouldn't thinking that be. way, right? You stop thinking that way. Shouldn't. The shooting isn't useful, right? Um, but that, that, it's not like you can say to yourself, stop saying should, stop being judgmental. That is kind of putting a lid on mm -hmm. being judgmental. Yeah, Easier more effective is to actually look at yourself very deeply 
and to see your own hypocrisy with some kindness, to see your own inability to live up to your own standards with some humility and humor naturally makes you less judgmental. You don't have to tell yourself, don't be judgmental. You just stop being so judgmental. Yeah, because you're not so hard on yourself in the right way, right? In a disciplined way, but still with friendliness. Is it making sense? Yes. Any gaps or um, trial and errors that you want to share? By resting your true nature in the sense of Buddha nature, that in fact it was all already there. I always find that a great way to focus uh, when things become less important. And you're not trying to fix anything. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. We go about our life denying these things, but it is saying so. We have this very disruptive human form, which is broken on every, in every way. Yeah. It's, you know, the Buddha nature is a reassuring thing. But also, I think it's, you don't even have to sort of force yourself to believe it, because you can kind of look through history and see that despite how crazy human beings have gotten, how much war, how much disaster we've created for ourselves, there is still this part of us that wants to connect and be of benefit, despite, you know, <laughs> I don't know, the Middle Ages, <laughs> right? We think it was bad now, right? Um, despite the Crusades, I don't know, pick a pocket in time where things were rough. Um, despite that, human beings still try and find ways to look after each other and be of benefit. Why would they want to? Even if they're unsuccessful and it doesn't happen consistently, why do we want to connect? Why do we want to be of benefit? Why do we seek purpose? This is kind of our Buddha nature, wanting to develop itself to its full potential. Yeah, and we can't ruin it. And because we really tried, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? We were probably a part of the Crusades, right? Yeah, we probably put people on the rack and burned people at the stake and been the ones burned. And yet, we still want to try is, is, is really good news, actually. Yeah, um, compared to some of those past lives, we're doing quite well. We were quite nice, right? Probably have done no beheadings recently. <laughs> you well done, right? No recent beheadings, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we feed our cat regularly, right? We really are very attentive to their needs. Yeah. We take our dog for a walk. Yeah, even when we're tired and don't feel like it. It's nice, right? <laughs> Doing so bad, right? We try and recycle, even though we know it's pointless and they put it all on the tip anyway. But we try, we want to, <laughs> right? Right, all these things. So, you know, if, if you're just kind of sitting, again, with the points that we started with, what is the relationship between renunciation and what is the relationship between that and compassion for both yourself and others. Are you feeling the difference between the way you would normally talk about self-compassion? That self-compassion and renunciation almost become the same thing. That the kindest thing you can do for yourself is to get out of samsara. And the best way to have compassion for others is to deeply understand your own situation and ability to become free from it. So do those links come together? Okay. Right then, dedicate. <laughs> All right, so let's do the four measurables again. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings never be separated from the happiness that is without suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from both attachment and hatred, holding some close and others distant. Okay. Have a good night to everybody. And um, maybe I'll see you on the weekend course or next time. <laughs>